Okay, thank you everyone for joining us today uh, for our National Primary Care Week uh, webinar with Dr. Neil Barnard. Today we're going to, he's going to discuss a little bit about nutritional interventions in the medical practice. Uh, so without too much further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Neil Barnard, who is a adjunct associate professor at George Washington University and also the president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. And so with that, hand it over to Dr. Neil Barnard. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Uh, when I was in medical school at George Washington University, which is where I'm on the faculty now, uh, we did not pay much attention to nutrition. Uh, when we did, it was understanding the biochemistry of the vitamins, which meant that I could uh, draw the structure of vitamin C and maybe describe what scurvy was. But once you get into medical practice, you realize you never see a case of scurvy. What you're seeing instead is the result of, of bad diets in general, and people have hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and certain cancers that are related to what they're eating, but um, the nutritional aspects of that are, are not taught enough in medical school. I think that is changing in certain places, but today I'd like to zero in on diseases that you're going to see a lot in practice, talk about uh, the dietary approaches to them, and then... Um, Toward the end of the lecture, I'm, I would like to talk about how you actually work this into your practice so that you're effective and so that your patients leaving your office say, that was the best visit of my entire life. Um, okay, so let's start with a lesson from Japan. The reason we're talking about Japan is this. Your patients will come into the office, and they'll say, uh, I've been really good this week. I didn't eat any bread at all, and since I have diabetes, I'm trying to avoid carbohydrate, and, and uh I, I haven't had any bread, I haven't, I haven't had potatoes. Uh, what, what they're saying is they read a book somewhere that said they should avoid carbohydrate, and that was sort of the whole approach to diabetes or weight problems. And that's where the lesson from Japan comes in. In Japan, you have the slimmest, longest-lived people on the planet. And if you look at what they eat, their dietary staple is not meat, uh, at least not traditionally, it's rice. A huge amounts of rice. In other words, foods that are quite rich in carbohydrate. And if you look at diabetes prevalence in Japan, in adults over the age of 40, before 1980, uh, diabetes was rare, 1 to 5 percent of the Japanese population. But around that time, what happened? Burgers arrived. Fast food chains set up shop in Japan and in other Asian countries. And they started serving foods that are everyday foods in the United States but were pretty new in Japan. The fat content of the diet started to rise from the 50s into the 60s, 70s, and particularly in the 80s. And carbohydrate intake started to fall. Rice began falling out of fashion while chicken wings came into fashion and cheese and that kind of thing. And by 1990, diabetes was 11 to 12%. This shows us two things. First, rice does not cause diabetes. If it did, they would have had a lot of it before and less now. It's the opposite. Secondly, diabetes is not primarily a genetic disease. There are genes that make diabetes run in families, so to speak. But we don't just give our children DNA. We give them recipes. We give them food habits. And that's the big thing that we're really seeing running in families. Uh, not so much genetic traits. Let's take a lesson from the United States. We don't have a rice-based diet here. We have a meat-based diet, unfortunately. And in the post-World War II period, meat consumption rose quite dramatically, reaching a peak in 2004 of over 200 pounds of meat consumed by the average American every year. Luckily, since that time, meat has been falling, uh, but our Diet is very, very high in meat compared to other countries, uh, particularly in Asia and in Africa and other countries. Um, let me say a particular word about chicken. Americans eat a million chickens per hour. Yes, that's right. The Americans overall eat a million chickens per hour. Uh, imagining that it's somehow health food, it's not. It's almost as fatty and high in cholesterol as beef or other meats. Let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Cheese consumption has increased dramatically over the last century or thereabouts. In 2014, the average person consumed almost 34 pounds of cheese per year. In 2017, we're over 35. Uh, 
Um, the problem with that is it's 70% fat, mostly saturated fat, high in cholesterol and sodium. If cheese were any worse, there would be Vaseline, but Americans eat huge amounts of it. And what's happened to our diabetes risk as these diet changes have occurred? Well, here's the diabetes map, um, and these are adults. And if you look up in the top, uh, you see diabetes prevalence in 1994 was less than about 4% of the adult population uh, up in the um, Washington, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, Minnesota. Then you look down, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, it's over 6%. But as meat was going up and cheese was going up, here's 1995 and 96 and 97 and 98, 99, 2000, the map is getting worse and worse and worse. And now I want to change the colors so you can zero in on specific counties. Look at whatever county you might live in, and as you can see as the years go by, the map was getting worse and worse and worse. As diets, as diets change, diabetes does not wait. It comes roaring in. Well, who does better? Researchers have looked at Seventh-day Adventists in particular because church teachings say you should avoid tobacco and alcohol and caffeine. They also say you should avoid meat. And almost all Seventh-day Adventists are very good on the first three of those. They're avoiding tobacco and alcohol and caffeine, but some of them avoid meat and some don't. That sets up a natural experiment. In 2009, the American Diabetes Association showed the results of this natural, quote, experiment. They compared the diets of about 61,000 participants and they just simply reported their body mass index based on the diets that people had chosen to follow. And as you know, body mass index is, is simply your body weight adjusted for how tall you are. And the, on the left, we have non-vegetarians, um, meat eaters, in other words, you're sort of an average American diet. And as you know, the average American adult is overweight, uh, as is also true among the Adventist meat eaters. Uh, their body mass index is not below 25, which is where we'd like to see it. It was 28.8. And then semi-vegetarians, meaning people who ate meat less than once a week, well, 27.3, a little better. Pesco vegetarian, what's that? Pesco is fish, that's right. The fish eaters were a little slimmer, but still not in the normal range on average. Uh, Lacto-ovo vegetarians did a little bit better, but still not, as, uh, not quite where we'd like to see them. And the group out on the right, I, I often have to tell my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas. It's a person following a totally, a, a totally plant-based diet, no animal products at all. And that happens to be the only group whose weight on average is in the healthy range. But when we look at the diabetes gradient, it's even more severe. The meat eaters have a lot of it, fish eaters have a moderate amount, and the vegans have an, an enviably low diabetes prevalence. Uh, we'll come back to why that is, but the point for now is if we are looking at populations that tend to be slim and tend to avoid diabetes, the vegans do dramatically better than all of the other groups. And the more you add uh, eggs, dairy, fish, or other meats to the diet, the more the uh, average waistline expands and diabetes prevalence increases. So you want to remember this when people say, what about fish? Uh, what about having meat in moderation? That kind of thing. I rem remember these. Uh, rem uh, remember these data. Okay. Um, my research team did a a study to test out a vegan diet, uh, and this study included people who had never done anything like a vegan diet before. They were 64 overweight women. They had done Atkins and South Beach and Nutrisystem and Jenny Craig and just about every other diet you can imagine. And we said, no, we're going to test something different. Uh, two rules, no animal products, and keep oils very low. So in other words, they're approximating the diet of the vegan group that we saw in the previous study. Now we asked the participants not to change their exercise patterns at all, and it was a 14-week study. Now, to think about the foods that they would be eating, we use something called the power plate, and this is a very handy tool. Uh, it shows patients uh, that they should focus on fruits, grains, vegetables, and legumes. You should show this to your patients. Uh, and they, when they ask what are legumes, you can answer legumes are beans and peas and lentils, foods that grow in a pod. And translated onto your plate, uh, that might mean blueberry pancakes or oatmeal with cinnamon or raisins, uh, 
If you had chili, instead of it being the meat chili, it would be the chunky vegetable chili. If your linguine arrives at dinner time, instead of being topped with meat sauce or Alfredo sauce or cheese, it might be topped with artichoke hearts and seared oyster mushrooms or uh, spicy tomato sauce or whatever. Uh, you're eating uh, what seems like quite an indulgent diet if a person's trying to lose weight, but this was the research study. So no animal products, keep oils very low. At 14 weeks, the average person had lost 13 pounds. That's good. Two inches off their waist. And their insulin sensitivity improved. We measure that with a glucose tolerance test. You feed the patient 75 grams of glucose, and you measure their glucose and insulin levels uh, over the next short period of time, and you notice that their sensitivity to insulin improves. We tracked them for two additional years. The weight never came back. So unlike every other diet these people had been on where they yo-yoed up and down, in this case, the weight loss seemed to be essentially permanent as long as they stuck with the diet. So then in 2003, we did a study testing the same kind of diet, but for people with type 2 diabetes. Again, no animal products, and you keep oils very low. We compared that to what I'm going to call the ADA guidelines. That's a diet following the guidelines of the American Diabetes Association, which typically meant, or at least at that time, meant cutting calories to lose weight and limiting carbohydrates and keeping them fairly steady from day to day and uh, throughout the day. This was a 22-week study, so about five months with a one-year follow-up. And to make a long story short, the thing that we track uh, particularly is A1C. Hemoglobin A1C is a measure of your blood sugar control, and it reflects how good your blood sugar control has been for the preceding three months or thereabouts. For a person with diabetes, you would like to see A1C below 7. At the beginning, our participants were around 8, uh, which is too high, and the red line shows the ADA group. It had a nice drop of about 0 0.4 absolute percentage points. That's good uh, over a 22-week period. But if you look at the blue line, that's the vegan group, they had a drop of about 1.2 absolute percentage points. That's a huge drop. Uh, as an average, it's incredible. It's the kind of thing that's frankly better than most uh, oral diabetes medications can do. And when we track them over the next year, the vegans retained their advantage. And when we look at cholesterol levels, LDL, are you familiar with LDL cholesterol? It's bad cholesterol. Um, it won't surprise you that it drops. This is the drop over a year and a half, 74 weeks. And it dropped a, a hair in the ADA group, but it dropped much more in the, in the vegan group. When we looked at body weight, both groups lost weight, and the difference between the groups was not statistically significant, which simply means that it, you can't rule out just the effect of chance. But what we notice here is that the vegan group actually lost a little bit more weight than the ADA group, and that's important because the ADA group was trying to lose weight. They were cutting calories typically 500 calories a day off what they would want. And all that struggle and all that hunger that they had to put up with, uh, they did not lose as much weight as the people who were free to eat as much, many pancakes and bowls of oatmeal and as servings of spaghetti as they might have wanted. So in other words, the vegan diet causes more effective weight loss, which is what we saw thinking back in the Adventist studies. The Adventist uh, vegans were the skinniest group by far, and they, they don't get that way by limiting calories. They get that way by... Uh, for other reasons, because the diets are high in fiber, people tend to fill up sooner, um, and uh, their body metabolism might be a hair better uh, among the vegans in the post-meal period. So we can talk more about that later if you'd like. Um, at Tufts University, researchers tested four different diets, 40 participants on each, 160 participants in all. And the diets were a low-carbohydrate diet, an Atkins-type diet, that is, or a zone-type diet, or a typical calorie restriction where you just ask the patient to cut calories, um, or finally a vegetarian diet, or a, a, it's almost a vegan diet. This was uh, the diet that was devised by Dean Ornish to help reverse heart disease, uh, which it does, and we'll come back to that later. But it was a little fat. He called it a vegetarian diet, but, the, but frankly, dairy and eggs and Meats and fish were, were completely eliminated, and, and dairy was a very, very small amount, maybe a half a cup, I think, of skim dairy. 
Um, so there are two ways of looking at this. Um, here's the data. If you run your statistics saying that if a person dropped out of the study, you're just going to assume that nothing happened, and so you, you use baseline data, baseline values for anything that's missing, here's the way it looks. The Atkins people do the worst. The Ornish people do the best, but, but the differences aren't really too great. Um, now we're going to do it in a different way. We're going to just look at completers. So if, if somebody didn't complete it, you just leave them out. And here they spread out more. The Atkins people still do the worst. The vegans do, or the vegetarians do the best. They have 6.6 um, uh, .6 kilogram uh, weight loss compared to only 3.9 for the Atkins people. So these data reinforce what we found, which is if you give a person a, a diet that eliminates the animal products, keeps oils low, they're going to tend to do really, really well. Uh, let me put a human face on this. This is Vance. He was in our diabetes study. Uh, Vance's father was dead by age 30. Vance himself was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes, and he came into the study and he was randomly assigned to his diet, which turned out to be the vegan diet. And he was quite happy with it because he says very easy, didn't require portion control or anything like that. And over about a year, he lost 60 pounds. He stopped his diabetes medications, which if you can imagine what that means to a guy whose father and other family members may have been affected by this. And his A1C, which as you know, is supposed to be under seven if you have diabetes, it was nine and a half to start and it fell to 5.3, which is in the normal range. Pre-diabetes starts at 5.7. 5.3 is a normal blood sugar. And the beauty of that is, can you imagine what it's like to have had been diagnosed with diabetes and to have all trace of it go away and you're on no medication and your, your blood sugar values are in the totally normal range. When I was in medical school, I was taught that once you have diabetes, you'll always have diabetes. It's a one-way street. It never goes away. But we have now seen many, many, many people where it can go away. And it, it, by the way, it will not go away for most people, if you give them the typical advice of limiting carbohydrate and setting calories, that's basically asking them to just have diabetes for the rest of their life. But on a plant-based diet, the diabetes improves dramatically, and for some people it goes away. Uh, in a minute, we'll talk about the mechanism. Uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you. Uh, when I was asking Vance his permission to share his experience, he said, make sure you tell everybody that my erectile dysfunction went away too. That's not a coincidence. Um, when you are on a vegan diet, there's no animal fat in your diet at all. There's no cholesterol in your diet. The arteries start to open up again, and that means you have better blood flow to the heart, but also better blood flow to all parts of your body, and male sexual function depends on good blood flow. So we see many, many people doing this kind of diet change, and they not only find they're, they're losing weight, but their sexual function improves, too, simply due to better blood flow. Um, this is Nancy. Nancy had a similar experience. She lost 40 pounds over about a year. She stopped her diabetes medications. Now, her A1C improved, although it's still in the diabetic range. And I'm doing this to make, I'm showing you this to make a point. Some people will find their diabetes can go away completely. Others do not. Um, it really just depends, I, in my belief, how long they have had diabetes and how badly it's uh, affected their pancreas. And in a person like Nancy, their pancreas is just making less insulin now, so they'll probably need uh, some medication to help them out. Nonetheless, uh, they do dramatically better on this diet, and it helps prevent complications and helps them greatly reduce the medications that they might need. She had an interesting experience that her arthritis improved dramatically. I believe that was because she left out dairy. As, of course, dairy, as dairy products are not a part of a vegan diet. And I am not sure that this is the case, but we have seen so many people where inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis appear to be triggered by dairy protein, such that when a person eliminates dairy, they get better. Now, don't take this on faith. If you have a situation like this, you can simply try it and see if it gets better. And if it does, you can challenge the person by having more dairy again. Or, and it may not be dairy. It might be some other food. But dairy seems to be the most common trigger for autoimmune anti-inflammatory conditions. All right, here's my most important slide. If you were doing your email while listening to this, please look at the presentation now. Um, I want you to look at this and memorize it. Um, I want to show you the cause of type 2 diabetes. 
This is a muscle cell. Uh, the reason I'm showing you a muscle cell is that if you could track the glucose molecules in your blood, where are they going? Most of them are going to your muscle cells. Most of the blood sugar, most of the sugar molecules in your blood are eventually ending up in muscle cells, and they are powering your movements. They're also maintaining your body temperature. But the glucose molecules are outside the cell. They cannot get inside the cell without the help of insulin. Insulin, as you know, is made in the pancreas, travels through the blood, and here I've depicted insulin as little keys that go into these red cellular receptors. And when the insulin key goes into the receptor, it signals channels to accept glucose into the cell. And here comes the glucose. There it is. See it? Okay, there we go. So the insulin key causes intracellular signaling to allow glucose into the cell. That's normal. Now, the problem is there's something else in the cell. See those yellow globs? That's fat. Um, could be chicken fat, beef fat, fryer grease, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil. Fats that we consume, in some cases, end up inside the muscle cells. Now, we doctors don't like short, simple words like fat, so we'll refer to it as intramyocellular lipid, but it just means fat inside the muscle cell. Here is the point. Type 2 diabetes doesn't start with rice or bread or any of those things. It starts with insulin resistance. The insulin resistance means the buildup of fat particles in the muscle cells. The buildup of fat particles is stopping insulin from being able to signal those channels to open up. Same thing in the liver cells. When you build up fat inside the liver cells, insulin signaling is no longer effective. That's insulin resist resistance. So are you with me? So when your patients come in and they say, um, I'm making a diet change, I'm throwing out soda, and I'm not eating sugar anymore, you can say, well, that's a good move because soda is not health food. But the cause of type 2 diabetes is something different. They will imagine that sh blood sugar rises because you're eating sugar. Well, sort of, but, that, but it's important to, that they really understand what causes type 2 diabetes. It's the buildup of fat, fat particles inside the cells, especially the liver cells and muscle cells. Okay, you with me? If, if type 2 diabetes starts with insulin resistance that is caused by fat buildup in the cell, then the treatment for type 2 diabetes has to target getting that fat out of the cell. That means if the patient leaves your office without having been given a vegan diet, which is a diet that eliminates animal fat, and also being counseled on how to limit the vegetable oils, then you have let them go without showing them what caused their diabetes in the first place. See what I mean? So the, the, the treatment for diabetes has to target that fat. All right. So now I'd like to talk to you about your car insurance. There's GEICO. That's GEICO's national headquarters. The reason I'm showing you that is that building is about four blocks from my office. And back in 2006, the GEICO uh, health director was talking with me on the phone, and she mentioned that they have 2,500 people working there, and many of them have weight problems or diabetes or other health conditions. So we decided to do a, a research study at GEICO. And we picked two GEICO facilities, this one, which is in the Washington, D.C. area, and another one, which is in uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia. And at both centers, we tracked weight, A1C for people with diabetes, and other factors. But at this uh, facility, we gave them two, two things. The first is we gave them a once-a-week a discussion group at lunchtime. And anybody who wanted to go vegan to lose weight or tackle their diabetes was invited to come to the lunchtime sessions once a week for 18 weeks. The second thing was in the cafeteria. Yeah, they had hamburgers, uh, drowning in cheese, but we asked them to have veggie burgers. The, uh, yes, they had bacon and sausage uh, for breakfast in the cafeteria, but we asked them to have an oatmeal bar so that they would have healthy vegan choices every meal, every day. Now, the... Uh, Results were very successful. People lost weight. Uh, their A1C improved. So we now did a new study, also with GEICO, in 10 different cities, um, all in all parts of the country. Because many people will say, well, this is Georgia, or this is California, or I'm in Texas, and you can't do this here. Well, we wanted to test that out. And what we found 
is that people did very, very well. Now, I have to say, first of all, the cafeteria manager was a little bit confused um, when we asked them to have vegan uh, products. Uh, they came up with a vegan burger with bacon and cheese. Okay. Anybody see what's wrong with that? Not good. Bacon and cheese don't belong. You're right. Um, however, they figured it out, and the control group didn't lose weight at all, but the intervention group lost, lost weight very, very nicely at 18 weeks. And those people who had diabetes, their A1Cs fell quite significantly. And by now, we've seen that this is just um, absolutely routine. Let me show you Hillary and Bruce. Hillary and Bruce came to every session. Um, my instructors were a little bit worried about Hillary and Bruce because they seemed to talk a lot. They sat in the back of the room and kind of chattered a lot and passed notes back and forth. And uh, some of the other participants felt distracted by their endless talking in the back. However, you can misjudge people. Far from being overly distracted, Hillary and Bruce were actually very, very motivated. And what they were talking about was the foods that they might pick up at the store on their way home and how they might have a Thanksgiving dinner for all their friends that was totally vegan. And after a year, Bruce sent me this picture. Hillary's lost 85 pounds, Bruce has lost 100 pounds. Uh, this was not through calorie counting or even exercise. This was entirely the result of a healthy plant-based diet. Um, now let me show you a meta-analysis. If you're not familiar with a, a meta-analysis, what you do is you take every study that's ever looked at a particular endpoint, in this case, what does a plant-based diet do for uh, hemoglobin A1C? And each line is a study. And if the result, that black square, is to the left of the zero line, that means that A1C fell. And as you can see, it fell in every single study. Um, now, on average, the combined effect was a drop, an A1C drop of 0 0.39. Now, that's a really an artificial number because if, you're all, if your A1C is already about 6 or something like that and you start a vegan diet, it's not going to drop a whole lot more than that. Um, if your A1C starts at 10, well, you could easily drop to 7 or 6 or something like that. So, so the true effect that you will see in the patient depends on where they start. If they start higher, they are usually going to have a, tip, a bigger drop. Um, by the way, this is a meta-analysis on the effect of plant-based diets and body weight. And now the zero line is on the far right. And as you can see, every single study ever done testing a plant-based diet, or in other words, a, a vegan or near-vegan diet, shows that people lose weight. It's a very, very predictable effect. And this is blood pressure, both uh, clinical, trials, uh, clinical trials of both systolic and diastolic blood pressure. And again, you see a very significant effect. Um, the, again, the only issue is if a person's blood pressure is already in the normal range, starting a vegan diet is not going to lower it too much. It might lower it a little bit. But on the other hand, if they started high, uh, then they're going to have a bigger drop. Okay. Um, this is Chicago. And in 1993, the Chicago Health and Aging Project got started looking not at diabetes or at weight problems, but looking at Alzheimer's disease. They brought in hundreds and hundreds of people. They tracked what those people ate. And the first foods they keyed in on were foods that were high in saturated fat. Think of bacon grease. Although the biggest source of saturated fat is actually dairy products. Meat comes in second. Now, in Chicago, some people ate relatively little saturated fat, around 13 grams a day. Others ate almost twice as much. And when you look at the Alzheimer's risk, those eating the most saturated fat at double or actually more than triple the risk of Alzheimer's disease compared to those generally avoiding saturated fat. Why does this occur? In short, I don't know. But researchers at Kaiser Permanente brought forth evidence suggesting that the issue might be cholesterol. If you're eating fatty foods, cheese, butter, milk, chicken, fish, other meats, your cholesterol level is going to rise. As cholesterol rises, your Alzheimer's risk rises too. So we believe what is happening is that in the same way as a high blood cholesterol is bad for the heart, it might actually change amyloid chemistry in the brain leading to Alzheimer's disease. Okay, I mentioned Dr. Ornish's diet earlier. And I'd like to revisit uh, some research that he did a number of years ago that was absolutely classic and very important. And it wasn't about diabetes, it wasn't about body weight, it was about opening up coronary arteries that had been narrowed by atherosclerosis. 
Atherosclerosis is a condition where particles of cholesterol have entered the artery wall, forming these raised bumps inside the cell called plaques. And if one of those plaques breaks open, a clot will form, and that clot stops blood flow, and that's a heart attack. So again, particles of cholesterol enter the artery wall, causing these raised plaques that can rupture, leading to a formation of a clot. Dr. Ornish wanted to know if these plaques can be made to shrink through diet change. So here's what he did. He asked participants to follow an experimental program with four steps. Vegetarian foods. Now, why would you want vegetarian foods for a heart patient? Okay, no cholesterol, right? No animal fat, fair enough. Also high in fiber, which is good too. He also asked that the participants to have a half hour walk every day to try to manage stress, which is why I don't think he had any medical students in the study, and to avoid tobacco. So vegetarian foods, have our walk, manage stress, avoid tobacco. There was no medication use, um, very, 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 and no surgery, of course. And they were compared to a control group following a chicken and fish kind of diet. And as you can see, in the experimental group, cholesterol levels, cholesterol levels fell dramatically. LDL, which is bad cholesterol, dropped 37%, which is great. The average person lost 22 pounds, and with an angiogram, which is a special X-ray of the heart, um, he found that the arteries were actually opening up again in 82% of participants with no medication, no surgery in the first year. Five years later, he tracked what really counts, which is do you have a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, or do you need angioplasty, or have you had bio, a bypass, or were you hospitalized, or did you have a cardiac-related death? And the risks were dramatically reduced in this intervention group. Um, so you might be asking, did the patients like it? I mean, they were on a vegetarian diet and so forth. Well, I actually flew out to California, and I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Ornish in interviewing all of his participants in the study. And we asked them how they liked it, how much work it was, what they planned to do in the future, and they quantified all these things on scales, uh, quantitative scales. And what we found was that the people in the plant-based group, the vegetarian group, said that it took them maybe four to six weeks to get used to the new diet, but they loved it, they liked the weight loss, they liked the simplicity, they liked the fact that their chest pain was gone and they were able to do things they hadn't been able to do for years, um, and most of them wanted to stick with it. In contrast, the control group said, surprisingly enough, uh, that they weren't really getting much benefit, that they didn't particularly like eating chicken and fish and chicken and fish and chicken and fish. Um, in, in other words, to our surprise, we thought the vegetarian diet would be rated as maybe perhaps being more difficult or something. Not at all. Uh, the patients seemed to, to find it no more difficult uh, compared to what you might think of as a much simpler kind of diet. So bottom line, using uh, plant-based diets in patients is not only highly effective, but uh, highly acceptable as well. So healthy foods are fruits, grains, legumes, and vegetables. Um, your patient will then say to you, but doc, where am I going to get my protein? Because they imagine that grains don't have protein or that beans don't have protein. You have to remind them or teach them if they didn't know this, is that there is a lot of protein in grains and beans and vegetables. Um, now, if, for example, you were to do a, a, an experiment and you ate nothing but broccoli for a day, let's say you ate 2,000 calories, uh, 2,000 calories is the normal amount of food that people typically eat in about a day. Um, if you ate 2,000 calories of nothing but broccoli, don't try this, but if you were to do it, you would get 146 grams of protein in a day. That's a lot. The average person needs maybe, oh, 46 grams of protein for a woman, 56 for a man, or roughly 50 grams of protein in a day. But if you ate nothing but broccoli all day, 2,000 calories would bring you 146 grams of protein. If the next day you ate nothing but lentils, you get even more, about 157 grams of protein. Now, in truth, it's much better to have a varied diet, and that's why nobody eats just lentils or just broccoli, but you eat a varied diet, but a varied diet of legumes and vegetables and fruits and grains gives you an abundance of protein without any special uh, calculations and without any use of meat. Uh, and even 
the most hardworking athletes will get plenty of protein from plant sources. Calcium, green leafy vegetables are the best source. That's where cows get them. You know, cows don't make calcium, cows just eat calcium. They eat grass as their green leafy vegetable, or we eat broccoli or kale or collards or Brussels sprouts or whatever, um, and they are nature's source of calcium. Vitamin B12 is essential. You need it for healthy nerves and for healthy blood. And patients on vegan diets should be taking a B12 supplement. The reason is animals don't make B12 and plants don't make B12, but it's made by bacteria. In a cow's intestinal tract, the B12, the B12 producing bacteria uh, will leak some B12 that ends up in the meat and the milk. Some people imagine that bacterial traces in soil or on plants will give us traces of B12. Don't count on any of that. Um, you want to just take a B12 supplement, which is at every drug store and every health food store. It's in every multiple vitamin. It's more than enough for any normal need. Um, but the thing you don't want to do is to miss it. Okay? So protein, not an issue at all. Calcium, a very easy issue with green leafy vegetables, also beans. Vitamin B12 should be supplemented. Okay. Um, let me now shift gears. And I'd like to talk to you about how to talk to your patients and how to help your patients change their diets because you know from your own life and from people that you've interacted with is that patients resist a, a diet change and that's, that resistance is actually a good thing because you don't want people to be just changing their diets willy-nilly with whatever fad comes along. It's good if, if people are a little bit skeptical. So welcome that skepticism, but you do need to teach them why you're gonna, you're gonna help them change their diet, why a diet change uh, really gets to the, the core issues that they're dealing with. Um, it should be obvious to them that a high cholesterol level is not caused by a Lipitor deficiency. It's caused by eating meat and dairy products uh, for the most part. There are some genetic influences, but for the most part it's dietary. Weight problems come from food choices. Diabetes comes from packing fat into cells. Hypertension also comes uh, from diet to a great degree. For all of these things, there are genetic factors that can play in, but the role of diet is enormous, okay? So we want to make sure that our patients are on the, are on the right uh, page with you on that. When the patient is in the hospital, that is a teachable moment. This is the time to say to the patient, while you're here, if you smoke, you're going to be a non-smoker from the first minute you arrived in this hospital. And if you're eating meat and cheese and things like that, I'm going to make you a vegan while you're here. You do what you want when you go home. But my hope is that when you go home, you'll be on a healthy diet and you'll have left those cigarettes behind. Okay? So among the worst foods are hot dogs and other processed meats. And I'm showing you these for a couple of reasons. Back in 2007, the American Institute for Cancer Research said that processed meats cause colorectal cancer. These are bacon and sausage and ham and hot dogs and other deli meats. These foods clearly cause colorectal cancer. Why does that matter? This is the second biggest cause of cancer deaths in the United States. 1.3 million Americans have colorectal cancer now. 50,000 are going to die this year. Um, these foods clearly contribute to it. In 2015, the World Health Organization said that, yep, it's true, these processed meats cause colorectal cancer. And it's dose-related. There is no safe level. These foods should be out of your diet, out of your family's diet, out of your patient's diet, out of your children's diet, 100%. Okay? The American Medical Association in June 2017 called on hospitals to do several things. Number one, we, they uh, call on the hospital to improve the health of patients, staff, and visitors by providing a variety of healthful food, including plant-based meals and meals that are low in fat, sodium, and added sugars. Look at number two, eliminate the processed meats from menu. That means no more bacon, no more sausage for your hospital patients or visitors or staff or you. Uh, also healthful beverages, okay? So Dr. Pepper is not a healthful beverage. Got it? Okay, so how do we teach our patients? Um, very important. You need a team. You need people to do this. If you don't have it, you don't have a competent clinic. Uh, if you're going to take x-rays, you need a radiology department either where you are or nearby. If you're prescribing medications, you need a pharmacist. If you're going to recommend a diet change, you need a nutrition expert. So what I'm saying is you don't have to do this yourself. You need people nearby who are nutrition experts. So the way to make it easy, the patient comes in. You're seeing the patient. You might do an exam, whatever. But when it comes to diet teaching, 
you if, as a doctor or a nurse practitioner can do what you need to do in three minutes. You say to the patient, you got diabetes. Let me take out a piece of paper, I'm gonna draw a cell, and your cells are filled with particles of fat, and because of these particles of fat inside your muscle cells and liver cells, glucose can't get inside. Are you with me? The patient says, that's the first time anyone's ever told me that. And you say, well, now I want you to meet with a dietitian who's gonna help you to understand a, a, what a healthy diet is, and then we're gonna also give you a program to help you get started. Don't feel a need to counter the patient's skepticism, just answer their questions and allow them to be a little bit skeptical, that's good. Soon enough, they're gonna to be totally convinced. So show them the diagram, they're gonna get pumped up. Now they see the registered dietitian, and that can take a half hour to an hour. The dietitian's job is to, to create a vegan menu for them asking what they like to eat uh, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and so forth. And then refer them to a series of classes. At our medical center, Barnard Medical Center, we have dietitians on staff in our clinic all the time, and we have classes on the schedule all the time, so there's never any delay. Your patients can go straight into making a diet change. They absolutely love it. They're supported all the way through, and the doctors love it because they don't have to be the nutrition experts taking an hour to teach every patient. So you see that number there for the doctors? Three minutes. That's all you need, sometimes less. Okay, now let's say, let me go to the classes and the nutrition support groups. I would encourage you to jump in and get involved in it so you can see what the process of change is like. At our medical center, we have people that, that run them, but I run them myself quite frequently um, because it's really, really an amazing thing to see people adopting a healthy diet. And, and you will discover that your patients will make huge changes. If you take on the role of a coach who believes in them and you don't moralize, you don't chastise them, you don't criticize them, um, and you model it with a healthy diet yourself. So here's the way that the room works, uh, the, the, uh, the groups work. We set up the room in one of two ways. It can either be a circle, kind of like a typical support group, but to tell you the truth, my preference is to have it be sort of a boardroom structure where we have a table in the middle because that way we can pass around samples of food. So you bring in soy milk or almond milk some week and maybe the next week it might be veggie sausage or, or whatever it is, different products. So the boardroom is a little bit better if you've got a space for it. Uh, with regard to how many people to include, I prefer to have between 15 and 20. If it's below 15, it seems too small and the patients think you're kind of looking at them a little too much. Uh, they don't feel quite anonymous enough. If it's more than 20, you don't really have enough time to, to give everybody the individual attention that they need, okay? So between 15 and 20 patients, boardroom structure is good and the group should take 60 minutes, no more. Uh, the way it starts is everybody gets weighed as they come in. We keep a digital scale set up. That is enormously helpful. It helps them to track their progress week by week. Um, what you're looking for is any degree of weight loss in an overweight person, obviously. It can be a pound, it can be a half pound, it can be one microgram, but if they're not losing weight at all, then something's not working. Um, have a digital, digital scale set up. Uh, they also know that if they're gonna get weighed on Wednesday, they eat better on the weekend <laughs> before it. So the weekly weigh-ins are very, very helpful. Then we go around the room, ask each people to describe their successes and their challenges. So uh, what they'll say is, my success is I found a neat recipe this week, and my challenge is that next week I'm going to North Carolina for a wedding, and I'm sure it's gonna be really unhealthy food. And at that point, they describe their success, describe their challenge, don't answer it. They're unsure what to eat. At this point, you need to involve the group. So you say, has anybody else been traveling or anticipating some travel? What do you think? What can we do? And then they'll say, um, let's see, I can pack some foods in my luggage or I could call ahead to the, the place. I could see if I could arrange a vegan option or uh, you know, they start problem solving together. Great, then you go on to the next person. Uh, what was your success? What was your challenge? My success was I found a great restaurant uh, where they had, I had a wonderfully healthy meal. My challenge is that my, uh, my spouse doesn't believe in this diet and, and is uh, eating all kinds of unhealthy things and leaving them all in the refrigerator. So then now don't answer it. Let the group answer it. They'll say, well, have you asked your spouse to keep their food on one side of the fridge and you can have the other side? Um, or have you asked them to maybe follow the diet with you or whatever? So they're, they're problem solving together. That group cohesiveness means they're gonna to wanna to come back because they're making friends, they're getting support, they are sharing successes together, 
and you're going to have this wonderful cohesiveness carrying them through. All right, so that brings you to, you're up to 30 minutes. Now do you give them some kind of presentation, how foods affect cholesterol or blood sugar or something like that. We have PowerPoint presentations on the PCRM website that you can use for free. And this serves an educational function. It also keeps them growing and learning and a little bit entertained and they keep wanting to come back. Finish off with looking ahead, give them some kind of assignment of things to look for in the next week. And at 60 minutes, everybody's out of the room. That's very important because you want to preserve the sanity of your instructors and also of your patients. Don't make this a, you know, a six hour event. 60 minutes is all they're going to need, okay? Now, when they're actually beginning the diet, we break it into two steps. The first step, and this is the first week of the class, I ask them not to eliminate any foods from their diet. I mean, they can if they want to, but, but that's, the assignment is not to eliminate anything. The assignment for the first week is just try out new foods, or as I call it, check out the possibilities. So what I mean is we take a piece of paper, and you should give a paper to each of your participants in the group. Write breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and leave some room for them to pencil in some ideas. So what the way we do it is because a plant-based diet is the most effective, um, that's the only kind of diet we use. Now, you might use different kinds of diets in your practice, but I would strongly, strongly, strongly urge you to teach low-fat vegan diets because they are they just work better than, than other diets for diabetes, for weight loss, for lipid control, for hypertension, for all kinds of things. Um, but your patient needs to think through, well, what's a vegan breakfast? So give them some choices. So it could be oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins or pancakes or, you know, I never tried almond milk on my cereal. Uh, is it good? I don't know. So you say, well, pick it up at the store, give it a shot. Have you ever tried veggie bacon? No. Give it a, give it a try. And if you like it, write it down. If you don't like it, you don't. So all we're doing is we're experimenting. I never had a pizza without cheese. I'll, I'll go to the pizzeria and I'll ask them to leave it off, see how it is. Um, then if they're in an Italian restaurant, what foods could they have that happen to be free of animal products? Uh, they're at a Mexican place. Can I get a bean burrito or veggie fajitas or veggie tacos? Uh, Chinese places, how about the rice dishes or tofu dishes or vegetable entrees? If I'm having Japanese cuisine, can I get vegetable sushi? The answer is, of course you can. Um, now, but keep in mind the patient's assignment is just to identify possibilities that are free of animal products that they might really like. If they're at a fast food place, they can leave off the, the uh, cheese and meat on a submarine sandwich. Uh, they can have a bean burrito, hold the cheese. Again, they're just checking out the possibilities. After seven days, they're back. The group is meeting again. And everyone has sheets of paper filled with ideas. And you go around the room, ask people for some of their favorites. And now the assignment for the next three weeks is a test drive. Let's do it all vegan all the time, using the foods you already know you like. And so the patients will all say, phew, that sounds easy because I like all these foods. I've got my breakfast figured out. In fact, I've stocked my shelves. I'm ready to do it. And the commitment is to do the diet for only three weeks. At the end of three weeks, two things will have happened. First of all, they're healthier. They're losing weight. Their blood sugars are improved. But secondly, their tastes are changing and they discover they're actually liking these foods more and more and more. Okay, let me finish up with a little tongue-in-cheek presentation for a couple of minutes that answers the question, what is the natural diet of human beings? Because I can hear you thinking, you're thinking, wait a minute, this Dr. Barnard has been preaching a vegan diet, meaning an animal-free diet, but aren't we meat eaters by nature? Well, a lot of us grew up that way. Personally, I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota, and I come from a long line of cattle ranchers, and my first job was at McDonald's, and I did think that meat was a normal part of life. And if you look back in time, you see some rather optimistic cave drawings from people going out on a hunt, hoping that they would capture an antelope or something. Well, if you look a little bit further back in time, we recognize that human beings are great apes, like chimpanzees or orangutans or bonobos or gorillas with great apes, and great apes do not eat ice cream or cheese. They are largely herbivores. Now, with a few exceptions, but for the most part, what they're eating is plants. And if you doubt that human beings are really naturally herbivorous, let me share with you three scientific tests that I think will prove it to you. The first is the dental test. 
Are you familiar with a dental desk? What you do is you wait for your cat to yawn. Now, look at those teeth. They're like razor blades. Those teeth are there to rip the hide off of a little animal and to rip the muscles off the bones, and that's a carnivore's rack of teeth. Now, go into the bathroom and look at yourself in the bathroom mirror, and you notice that your canine teeth are no longer than your incisors. In fact, you don't have the dentition that would allow you to kill animals or remove the hide or to remove the muscles from the bones or anything like that very effectively, nothing like a meat eater. Um, those are the teeth of an herbivore. I've got another test for you, the bunny test. Are you familiar with the bunny test? No? You take a bunny. You put the bunny in front of your cat. Now, your cat could be six months old. Your cat must devour that bunny. Your cat's a carnivore. That, uh, your cat's never seen a bunny, but he's hardwired to eat him. Now, you can put the very same bunny in front of a toddler or a baby, and what you discover is that your toddler says, bunny. Not in a million years would your toddler say, I shall eat him. That just doesn't happen. And as a matter of fact, um, if a bird falls to the sidewalk with a broken wing, a cat might think, great, once dropped into my lap, and it's going to be pouncing on him like, within a matter of seconds. If a broken, uh, a bird with a broken wing falls in front of the most hard-hearted human being, never in a million years would they say, mm, great, let's have lunch. A little bread and mayo is gonna make, make this bird into something wonderful. It doesn't happen to us. It kind of breaks your heart to see animals suffer that way. We are naturally herbivores. All right, third, the box test. You take a box. The box has some kind of electronics in it. Uh, an iPad, a, a telephone, a camera, and you search around in, amongst the packing peanuts, and what you discover is there's a pack of silica gel. Silica gel, as you know, is there to keep it nice and dry, uh, to absorb moisture. But the silica gel manufacturers are very wise. They have put three words on every pack of silica gel. Do not eat. What does this tell us? This tells us that human beings are naturally herbivores, but we'll put any darn thing in our mouths, including meat and cheese and unhealthy stuff and probably silica gel if it wasn't marked that way, okay? Now, this is a carnivore. A dog is a carnivore, and carnivores have to be able to detect prey and they have to be able to catch prey. So a dog has big ears that allow them to hear in fact, they can hear frequencies that you can't detect. You know that. You know the dog whistle that has frequencies that are out of human range. And they have an enormous nose that can smell prey from far distances. They can, they can detect that prey has been by here, whereas human beings have tiny little ears and cute little noses, and we couldn't detect prey if our lives depended on it. Also, dogs are very, very fast. Um, uh, carnivores in general are very, very quick, very agile, and their feet, human beings, by comparison, are very slow. Well, I asked Richard Leakey, when did human, you know Richard Leakey, the famous paleoanthropologist, said, when did human beings become carnivorous? He said, wait, human beings are not carnivores. We have never been carnivores. But what allowed us to pretend to be carnivores was the Stone Age. Because you're a slow bipedal hominid, um, but you don't have to be very fast if you have an arrow, because the arrow is fast. So you're still a, a slow herbivore, um, but an arrow can kill your prey. And then when you arrive at your prey, you don't have sharp claws or to remove the, the hide. You don't have sharp teeth. But if the Stone Age has given you implements that allow you to remove hide, then you can pretend to be a carnivore and you can eat meat. Um, herbivores aren't quick. They don't have very good senses uh, because you don't have to sneak up on a strawberry. But if you have stone tools, you can eat basically anything that you want to. The final thing that I want to share with you uh, is a set of resources that you can use and that your uh, patients will benefit from. The first is an online program called the 21 Day Vegan Kickstart. It's totally free and non-commercial provided by the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, PCRM, which is my group. Um, it starts at the beginning of every month and the patient can simply log on to the website, enter their email address, and they get daily emails with menus, recipes, 
cooking videos all for free. Um, there's a free app as well, and uh, it's in English, Spanish, Mandarin, and a special program for people from India. We also have a Japanese program, all for free. We've had approaching 600,000 people go through this program. No commercial sponsorship, uh, not promoting anything whatsoever. Um, for you, uh, as budding clinicians, let me make a pitch for the nutrition guide for clinicians. We make this available to all second-year medical students um, in the U.S. and Canada. If you haven't gotten it, let us know. We'll be glad to make sure you do get them. Um, this, this, this is the second edition. The third edition is coming out uh, in 2018, and it will be both in print and also uh, downloadable for your handheld. Uh, let me also mention Nutrition CME. This is continuing medical education for people uh, after they've graduated from medical school, but it's also free, and it will go into many, many nutrition topics and keep you up to date. Uh, go to, if you're coming to the American Medical Student Association 2018, we've already reserved our booth. We'll be at booth number 39. Tattoo that on your arm and come visit us. It's next March, Washington, D.C. Um, also, if you would like to have a speaker come to your medical school, um, here are email addresses of Manuel Calcano and Zishan Ali, who they or, or I would be more than happy to come and speak. Uh, lead groups get you going. Um, the last thing that I just want to say is a big thank you. Your patients are so eager to get away from unnecessary medications, to feel like themselves again, and their families don't want to lose them. When we neglect nutrition, we're neglecting the cause of the things that bring most people into your office. But on the other hand, when you take the tools that we've described and you put them to work in your own life, yep, you ought to be trying a healthy vegan diet too. See what it's like to live without meat and cheese and so forth. Um, and when you're a model of health and you pass these things along to your patients, they are going to appreciate it. You'll never know how many lives you'll save, but I guarantee you, you'll be the best doctor your patients ever could have had. Thank you for letting me spend this time with you. And if there's a little extra time, perhaps we can take some questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnard. That was a wonderful presentation. I will open it up to any questions that our uh, attendees have. So if you'd like, you can just type it into the chat box or into the Q&A, and we'll uh, wait for a little bit and see if there are any questions. All right. I actually do have one question, Dr. Barnard. You gave us some great resources to check out uh, if we are more interested in adopting a more plant-based diet for ourselves or for our patients, and that included your website for the Kickstart, uh, the CMEs, and the guides. Where else or what are some other resources we can find uh, to help us with that endeavor? Can we, on your website, find other places for recipes, uh, et cetera, et cetera? Where, where, where sure. else can we look? Well, th thank you for asking. There, there's lots of different resources, and different people look for different things. Um, I have written many books, and I don't want to sound overly self-promotional, but if you put my name, Neil Barnard, into Amazon, you'll see lots and lots of them. And each book that I write is a tool. So I have one focused on diabetes, one focused on the brain and Alzheimer's disease, I have books focused on weight, weight control and chronic pain, so I would encourage you to look at them because the things I think are most important are things I put in books. Uh, but there are many others. Dean Ornish has great books. John McDougall has great books. Michael Greger has a fascinating book called How Not to Die, um, which has really gotten a lot of attention. There are many movies, and uh, the movies, in my view, are less information and more sort of inspiration, so forks over knives or what the health or eating you alive and uh, th these are movies that, that have motivated a lot of people to, to want to make changes. And, yes, at our website at pcrm.org, you'll see lots and lots and lots of recipes and lots of informational materials, and I hope you're able to take advantage of them. Excellent. Oh, by the Thank way, you. Uh, yeah. By the way, l let me just add one other thing. Um, I know that when, when we talk about following vegan diets and things, it, it does sound to some people a bit extreme. Um, However, the, as I mentioned earlier, the AMA has made a pitch that all hospital patients should have vegan meals available to them. And the American College of Cardiology this past year came out saying, uh, going further, um, because of the effect of reversing heart disease, 
and being the most effective diets, they said that they, that vegan diets should be promoted to to uh, hospital patients. So, um, what what I guess I thought of as kind of extreme when I was growing up in North Dakota has really become much more mainstream now. So, uh, I would encourage everybody to give it a try, become expert in it in the same way as a generation ago we had to quit smoking and become experts in being non-smokers. It's kind of the same thing. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So if there's any more questions, we will leave it there. Uh, once again, thank you so much, Dr. Barnard, for uh, giving us this presentation today for our National Primary Care Week for AMSA. Uh, we appreciate you coming out for that. So Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you're in the Washington, D.C. area, come by, see us at Barnard Medical.